let me introduce our speaker for this evening. I'm sure many of you will know Sarah, but for those of you who don't, Sarah has a background in geography and archaeology, and she's now the cartographic and managing editor of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, which is a research project of the Royal Irish Academy. And I'm sure that's an aspect of the project we'll be hoping to hear more about and hear Sarah's thoughts on this evening. Sarah has been responsible for the mapping and production of 22 atlas fascicles, seven pocket maps, and eight ancillary publications from the Irish project. And in addition to carrying out the cartography for the project, she was co-author of uh, the uh, uh, volume on Longford and is co-editor of the Maps and Text series of publications on towns from the Royal Irish Academy. And she has produced volumes in 2013 and 2018. She is also a member of the Atlas Working Group of the International Commission for the History of Towns. So a very distinguished speaker, and it gives me real pleasure now to hand over to Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Liz. And I'll just share my screen now to get the um, presentation going. If that's OK, make sure it all works. So I, I hope you can all see that OK. It's fine, Sarah. OK, thank you, Nick. So thank you very much for the introduction, Liz. And uh, just to echo the warm welcome to all the colleagues from all over the world that are, are, are joining us today. And thank you, Liz. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Stuart. And thanks to Tosca uh, for hosting this Historic Times Atlas series and for inviting me along to speak as part of the Irish aspect of things today, which I'm really very delighted to do, uh, following on from Daniel Strack, who spoke a couple of weeks ago on the German side of things. And then, of course, Keith Lilly last week, who spoke about the British Historic Times Atlas and in advance of Catalina Senza in a couple of weeks, who will speak from her own perspective um, from East Central Europe. So it's, it's been a really lovely opportunity for all of us, I think, uh, to combine forces and come along uh, virtually uh, to the Tosca series. So for those of you who may be joining for the first time or maybe you've managed not to know this, but the Historic Times Atlas is part of a pan-European endeavour. And just the little graphic at the top right of the screen uh, shows a map of the over five 180 towns and cities all over Europe from I, I think 19 countries that have been covered as part of the overall scheme uh, to date. So I'll be speaking from the Irish side of things uh, this evening. So I'll just move on. So our project is the Irish Historic Towns Atlas and this evening I'm going to be speaking sort of to six, six topics I suppose. The first will be um, the identity of our project and the impetus. So I suppose the idea of who we are and why we're doing what we do. The second will be, I'll be looking at the towns and cities that we've produced so far. Uh, so where we're talking about. Number three is the format of our atlas and the activities we carry out. So how we do things. And then four, I suppose the central component of the whole thing is getting into what we do in the atlas, the various components of our atlas. Number five and number six then, the final two sections, we'll be looking at some of our digital mapping and the progression of the project uh, through the many years that we've been undertaking it and maybe where it's going to go in the future. So to get going, uh, I suppose, my own role in the Irish Atlas is, as Liz said, I am the managing and cartographic editor. So I look after the production and the cartography for the IHTA, as we call it, as well as having a coordinating role for the team here in Ireland, who are a very dedicated bunch indeed. There's a kind of what I would call a devotional aspect to the creation of historic towns atlases, and I'm sure Daniel and Keith and Catalan would back me up on that and all, all of the colleagues. Uh, so I do think it's important before we get going that you should know who's who's behind or maybe in front of the Irish Atlas scene. And I work alongside as, as Atlas staff, as it were, uh, Jennifer Moore and Frank Cullen in the Royal Irish Academy. 
our honorary editorial board are Michael Potterton, Howard Clark, Raymond Gillespie, Ruth McManus and Jonathan Wright. Angrid Sims, one of our founding editors, is still actively involved as consultant editor and as our kind of guiding light, if I may use the term. Other key people in our project would be Rachel Murphy and Keith Lilly, who are particularly involved in the IHTA digital aspect of things. Uh, Colm Lennon and Angela Byrne would work on our suburban series for, for Dublin. And just to mention also the, the great cartographic historian John Andrews, who died in 2019, as many of you will know, but he was very involved in, in the earlier days of the project and, and continued on as consultant editor indeed for many years. And just to mention also Jacinta Prunty, who many of you might be familiar with as well. And Jacinta was very involved as an editor for many years as well, um, up until a couple of years ago when she made the move to uh, work in South Sudan. So, um, then, of course, we have our network of authors and contributors who are attached to the various towns and cities covered. A very important network indeed, and it wouldn't happen without them. And also, just at the very end of the slide there, just to mention Ordnance Survey Ireland and Northern Ireland, both partners in our project, and again, key partners at that. So if there's any doubt, this is a collaborative venture essentially academics, local historians with an interest in towns from various backgrounds, history, geography, archaeology and architecture and from various institutions, so interdisciplinary and interinstitutional. We are an atlas, so of course maps are central to our research and to our publications as a source and as a tool for interpreting and understanding the processes and people that have shaped our towns and cities. <clears throat> so in terms of there are the people involved, but just to turn to maybe the institutional side of things and that, that side of our identity. The base camp for the Irish Historic Times Atlas is the centre picture there, uh, the Royal Art Academy, which is on Dawson Street in Dublin. And the Academy itself was founded in 1785 to promote the study of science, polite literature and antiquities. And when the Irish Historic Times Atlas was founded as a project in 1981, the Academy already had a long tradition of supporting mapping projects. And in fact, the first librarian of the Academy was the cartographer, Daniel Beaufort, and he was appointed as librarian of the Academy in 1788. On the right-hand side, you will see um, some of the volumes of the Ordnance Survey, the first edition Ordnance Survey, and indeed the Academy Library holds a substantial part of what we could, would consider the Ordnance Survey archive. So the letters and memoirs that were created alongside the six inch maps and other maps in the 19th century. And we're very, very proud of that. So there's a strong link between the Academy and the Ordnance Survey. And also other mapping projects through publications and committees. On the left hand side, you'll see the Atlas of Ireland, which was published in the late 70s uh, via what was the Committee for Geography then. So again, an interdisciplinary committee of uh, ge geographers. So we, we have this, this long link. And the Academy itself has provided the Atlas project with security, organisational structure and general support uh, for the project. And IHTA is one of six staffed and dedicated research projects which are hosted in the Academy at present. So we're one of six projects that carry out research, direct research. Let's move on. So the identity of the IHTA is and always has been a dual one. So nationally, as I said, we're a Royal Irish Academy research project. And internationally, and the reason I'm here today, we are part, of course, of the International Commission for the History of Towns the European Historic Towns Atlas Programme. And these two characteristics have supported one another very, very happily. Ireland is somewhat of a middle child in the whole international scheme. 
And we heard from Daniel and Keith in the past couple of weeks of, of Germany and Britain's activities in the project from the 50s, 60s and 70s. But it was, it was 1981 by the time Ireland joined. And without a doubt, I think, when the Academy officers agreed to publish an Irish atlas, that international association, the guidelines that had, they had established, the network, the programme, the publications that were already in place, they were now up and running for over 20 years. They were crucial governing factors in the decision for Ireland to host their project and for the Academy to take it on board. The international link, the idea of looking beyond our own place, our towns, our country, continues to inform and contribute everything that we do and today. So, and you can see in the slide, a couple of examples of that from our recent IHT, well, recent enough when we were able to gather and we're able to gather again, thankfully, but from I, recent IHTA seminars and exchanges with colleagues from the international scene, many from the British Historic Times Atlas, who we have convened in, in association with for the past number of years, the annual IHTA seminar. So it's you can see the happy faces we we all enjoy sharing our knowledge and uh, learning from each other in this international endeavour. And here we all are in, in Academy House. Uh, but just to say that we also enjoy the aspect of when we travel outside as well. Uh, and there is an annual meeting of the International Commission for the History of Towns, uh, usually every year in September. And that provides us with a great opportunity to go and a uh, meeting of minds and learn about what others are up to, different methodologies, updates on towns that have been produced. There's a, an annual conference. And you can see here, uh, top left, that's um, some of us in the wonderful Historic Times Atlas Library in the Institute for Comparative Urban History in Minster. Some of us were there in, in 2016 with Daniel Straka. Uh, and this on the right is Angret Sims and Michael Potterton, two important members of our board, on their way to Salzburg, stopping off in, in Munich Airport on the way to the International Commission meeting, happily, as you can see. And then, um, the last very large meeting we had in person, of course, was in Budapest in 2019. And you can see there a beautiful evening from the rooftop of the Central European University with Catalan Sensei. And well, that's the back of, of Daniel's head as, as they're trying to orientate the map. I think these things are very important. So there's a, a two way exchange and that international aspect is, is a very important thing to all of us that are part of, of Atlas projects, I think, or across Europe. So to move on to the impetus, and I think if the Academy was the right place to host the Irish Historic Times Atlas, then 1981 was probably the right time. And as we know, nobody makes a map, let alone an Atlas, without some kind of motivation. And if the destruction of built heritage in the Second World War had been the catalyst for the international scheme, which was set up in 1955, with the idea of connecting urban our urban heritage and understanding what we had lost in, in the war. In Ireland, it was the destruction of built heritage associated with what became known as the Woodkey Saga in the late 70s and 80s that provided an impetus for us here. In 1978, the famous Save Wood Key protest march took place in Dublin City and over 20,000 people took the streets to object to plans by Dublin Corporation to build its new civic offices in an archaeologically rich part of Dublin's historic core beside Christchurch Cathedral. You can see this in the slide. Though construction eventually went ahead, the national heritage outrage and momentum garnered during this time led to lasting gains. And I think the establishment of the IHTA may be seen in that context. And we heard like with the International Commission and the, the work of, of Hein Stoop and Lobel in Germany and Britain, they provided a, a framework for a newly founded and ambitious uh, Irish Historic Times Atlas Committee, which would have been led by John Andrews, FX Martin and Angrid Sims, coupled with the enthusiasm and momentum harnessed for urban heritage by Wood Key, 
and of course the institu institutional support I've already mentioned by the Royal Irish Academy and Ordnance Surveys, the project got underway in 1981 and our first towns, Kildare and Kirk Fergus, were published in 1986 and I suppose we have developed from there. So on the left hand side you can see some of the influences um, that led to the, the framework that was devised for the Irish Historic Times Atlas scheme. So it was very, very important time for us was 1981. So moving on to the where and where we fit in in Ireland and what fits in in terms of what we do in terms of our towns and, and, and cities. So as you can see from this is our, our map of, of towns <clears throat> produced all over Europe in the, in the in the whole European scheme, and uh, you know Ireland is it's in its peripheral location. I'll just try and maybe zoom up here. Um, I hope you can see that okay. We're in the on the periphery of Europe, of course, but we like to consider ourselves as very much of a going concern in the whole scheme, and. Uh, you can see uh, that we have a, a good distribution of towns published to date since 1981 and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I just want to draw your attention at the bottom to the interactive map, the link, which is uh, a, a LinkedIn interactive map hosted by the Institute for Comparative Urban History in Minster and that's the place to go if you want to find out more about the uh, wider European scheme if you're interested in what towns have been done in what countries and you can get the URL to the individual national schemes and, and see what's available there whether it's online or in print or both. So to move on to our own Irish Historic Towns Atlas among one of the first decisions of the Royal Irish that, that the Academy made was that the Dublin-based town atlas should cover the whole of Ireland, north and south. And this resolution followed the all Ireland example set down by the constitution of the Academy. So the Royal Irish Academy is an all Ireland Academy. So that's why you see the northern Irish towns of Derry and Carrick Fergus, Belfast, Downpatrick and Armagh have been published as part of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas Scheme. And I just noticed earlier that this is not a trick, uh, some of the black text here. So we've lost Carlingford there and we've lost Dublin, sorry, Dublin and Bray um, and Dungarvan here. Anyway, that, that is, that's, that's not a quiz for you to, to carry out. The point I'm really trying to make here is that we are an all Ireland project and always have been. Um, so I just move on. Uh, so these are the towns and cities that we have published so far in Carlo and there's a mistake on this slide because I was rushing with this topic, this presentation and Car please take Carlo should not be there it's not published yet Margaret Murphy has not complete completed it yet sorry Margaret you'd be pleased to see it there I don't think you're with us thankfully so regional coverage was very important in in choosing what towns to cover but it, it wasn't the only uh, consideration and when the project was set up a lot of thought went into what towns and this is a question that came up for Keith last week what towns uh, were to cover because of course every town is important in its own way so a list of 40 towns was drawn up and it was a selection representing various size categories various regions of the country various periods of origin, growth and change, with some bias in favour of the medieval period, but not excluding estate towns, industrial towns and resort towns, more characteristic of modern times. So there was a kind of typological uh, as well as a spatial approach but it, to the strategy of, of choosing towns that were to be published as part of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas scheme. So to date, as I mentioned earlier, we published our first towns, Kildare and Carrick, Kildare here, and Carrick Fergus in 1986. And since then, just last year, we published number 30, which is Dungarvan down in the south of the country. And we have a reasonably good geographical coverage and many more towns in the pipeline. Westport and Tralee will fill some gaps there. And of course, 
next year we'll have a major addition to the scheme which I'll talk a little bit more about later which will be the city of Cork so those of you who are worried that you don't see Cork on the map don't worry because it's coming soon so the list on the left hand side are just to show the kind of typology that one uh, might approach we have various monastic towns Viking towns, Anglo-Norman. These are main periods of origin. So many of these towns will have several identities in the years that are outlined here. But I suppose it's it's just an attempt at, uh, at a typology, which is, is something. So you can see Bray definitely existed before the 19th century, but I suppose its boom was as a 19th century uh, tourist resort where people came out on the train uh, from from Dublin and uh, took the water there. So that's uh, just to show the different ways we can split up our towns. And just at the bottom here as well is to mention that, of course, we do produce since 2017 a suburbs as well. And you'll see some examples from that later. So we do have a Dublin suburb series. Um, a sub series of the atlas if you like and we've produced a couple of suburbs of, of the city of dublin in that the suburbs of clontarf and rathmines with war to come so how do we do what we do what's the format and what kind of activities what do we what how do we produce it basically it's there's a printed atlas and then there's an online digital element to what we do. And we have produced 30 printed atlases to date, and we have several strands in the digital output as well. Um, there continues to be a very healthy market, despite um, you know, the joys of, of digital access and the accessibility, accessibility it provides. Uh, we would consider that we still have a very healthy market for our fascicles, as we call them. Um, so here we have draw it on the left hand side. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see this is the kind of I don't know I don't know what you can see, but that's what it looks like in my hand. Uh, they cost between about 30 and 35 euros to buy, which is I would think extremely good value for what you get because obviously there's lots of beautiful loose sheet maps in in, in each of those. So th there's two essential formats, print and digital, and that continues. To stick with the print publications, this is just a sample. So to top left-hand corner there is, is, that's what we would call our core series, the Atlas Fascals, and we've published one to 30, number one to 30 of those. Um, and uh, so that's the, the basic format. Um, then from time to time, we produce bound volumes of the fascicles, bring them together and bind them. We have three of those bound, bound volumes. This is volume one, you can see um, the first uh, six towns were published as volume one, Kildare, Carrick, Fergus, Bandon, Kells, Mullingar and Sloan. After that then we have the Dublin Suburb series, which I mentioned, and you can see the format there. That, that's Rathmines, which was literally just published last October. Um, great local interest in, in the Dublin Suburb series. Um, then uh, the pocket maps. Uh, these are, you know, folded maps, uh, historical compilation maps. I'll be showing you an example. We've uh, seven of those in our in our catalogue. Uh, the maps and text series down here. Liz mentioned that these are really essentially conference proceedings based on the comparative work of the atlas, which I'll be talking a little bit more about. So once once we got to once we had a, a good sample of atlases, we started to actually engage in one of the purposes of the whole atlas scheme which is to compare our towns and really the maps and text series of publications is a, is a way of outputting the results of that then as, as also there's the the map extract books as we call them so these are where we, we just can't do the most magnificent maps of certain places any justice enough justice in the atlas we have published a couple of books which focus on one map one is the pictorial map of galway so there'll be 40 extracts from that map with a commentary and the same for john roke's map of dublin which of course shows individual plots and buildings we have a catalog maps of Derry, and a user's guide uh, the reading the maps uh, user's guide online outputs we have two aspects to our 
digital output. One is what we call IHJ online, and that's essentially PDFs of the text section and core maps for our fascicles number one to 28, so that provides access. And then there's another strand, which are our digital atlases. And these are GIS based projects using IHTA material. And we have uh, digital atlases for Derry, Feathered, Galway and Dungarvan and more in progress. So that's um, more interrogating the maps and the text. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later again. Outreach is a very important aspect of our project. Um, it's part of the strategic plan for the Academy. Um, our board have always been very keen to make sure, make the, the results of the Atlas publications open to as, as many people as possible, especially in the towns concerned and, and trying to feed back into public life, into town life, into planning decisions and back uh, to be helpful to people um, beyond uh, research. So I just popped up a few photographs here of some of our outreach activities for the Irish Historic Times Atlas. We have our annual seminar top left. Uh, we would run an annual student studentship scheme with Maynooth University, that's bottom right, we see some students who come to the Atlas to learn how to engage with sources when studying towns. That's basically the essentials of that. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with libraries here in the bottom left. You see my colleague Jen sitting down um, uh, with uh, workshops for people again using the Atlas. We do exhibitions when we can, top right. This was an exhibition in Galway. Uh, we love our launches. So much work goes into these Atlases that we are always delighted to celebrate with townspeople. And in this case, here with uh, President Michael T. Higgins, a great occasion to go to um, the Auris with our uh, uh, Drogheda author and people from Drogheda to celebrate the publication of Drogheda in 2019. Local history and heritage groups, we do some work with the Heritage Council. Um, and then of course we have uh, national uh, weeks and celebrations and, and festivals that we would always try our best to get involved in as well. Heritage Week, Culture Night, uh, book festivals and, and that kind of thing. So out outreach is something um, we do when we can. Important aspect of this, uh, ever increasingly so, of course, is our website, uh, which you can see here, and also social media. And my colleague Jennifer Moore would do a lot of work in this in this realm. And you can just see a little sample of the kinds of things um, that we use the social media for, whether it's like an online exhibition that we would have done with the authors concerned on Dublin suburbs last summer when everything was really had to be online. Um, publicity around the publication of Rathmines uh, in our in, a, in the national newspaper, the Irish Times, and then you're able to promote it on Twitter and get it out to a wider audience. And then, of course, our annual seminar last May uh, was all fully online as well for the first time. Uh, but we had a, a fantastic audience of over a thousand plus people who were able to register and watch who may not have been able you know, you would never have been able to get that number of people into the academy. So, you know, there's that that's become a, 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 an important aspect to what we do. And as we all know, people love maps and love uh, seeing as, as much as possible. So that's great for us. So just to move on now to the, the Atlas components. Um, and I suppose just to mention here, like what an atlas is, is composed of, what's in an atlas. And I've mentioned comparison already, but just to mention it again, that, you know, it's, it's the comparison. The comparison is, is really the driving force of the, of the whole international scheme. The idea is that you can look at towns, you can look at maps of the same, of, at the say, of the same scale and general style. Um, for of the present and the past and try and understand them in a comparative way and looking at towns across Europe in a comparative way. And the Atlas scheme is, is, is really to enable research, to provide the materials for research in which to do that. So how we do it is by providing these core maps. And these, these, these are the maps that we are required to produce to be part of the wider historic towns Atlas scheme. So a little slide of, of some of those for that's the Atlas of Dungarvan. But for the Irish 
historic times atlases are core maps, are comparative maps, are called map one, map two, map three, and map four. And the general uh, ingredients for each of those maps are, are, are listed here, but you can see these are the standard scales um, that would link into the guidelines laid down by the uh, European Historic Times Atlas scheme. And I will be showing you some examples of those. Map two, as I've said here, is within those core maps. Map two is the principal map in each of our atlases. It's a redrawn from the mid 19th century Ordnance Survey town plans and edited following a standard legend and scale. And the scale is 1 to 2,500. And that's the most, that, that's common. And if, if you were present for Daniel's uh, lecture the first week, he showed lots of examples of these across Europe very helpfully. And, and, and he has actually bro broken, that, broken them down into it and classified them within themselves. So this, it, it, it's a cartographic story in itself, I think. Nick mentioned cartographic stories the, the first week, and I, lo I, I love that idea. So the, the principal map at the scale of 1,500 is the most fundament, is fundamental to the expression in the introduction to each atlas that large scale plans constitute the best kind of source material for a comparative anal analysis of the topography of European towns. So I might just try and um, zoom up here again. Um, so you can see here, this is our schema that we use. So the, the, one of the main aspects of this map is that each individual um, premises is outlined. So you're getting internal boundaries there. And public buildings are outlined in red, private buildings in pink, um, gardens in green, and you get your legend here, the town wall, if, as we have it. And one aspect of the Irish project is that it's entirely based on the ordnance, contemporary ordnance survey, the date of this map of Galway is where we are, sorry, on the west coast of Ireland, apologies. Um, beautiful town of medieval town of Galway. This is Galway in 1839. So, and we, we replicate what was on the original source material quite uh, closely. We don't really waver from that. And that's our, our schema there. So just to, these are two of our smaller towns and these would be classified in the typology we saw earlier as, as monastic towns or towns which had origins in the monastic, as monastic centers, which was of course a huge aspect of Ireland's history and town history. So these Kells and County Meath and Armagh, these are the map twos for, for, for those towns. And this I suppose shows where, uh, that map two comes into its own in terms of reading the historic landscape. And uh, you can see in there, or we like to think that you can see in their town, in the, in the map, in the town plan, as we pre present it, you know, clues to the past, the outer enclosure, monastic enclosure here, the inner sanctum of Kells with the St. Columbus church in, in the center, and comparatively then in our map, the inner sanctum here and the outer enclosure. So you're looking for traces in street names, in the street street pattern, in the plot pattern. You're able to draw conclusions or, you know, s s trigger research in different directions. But what the whole idea is that you're going outside the pl one place and taking a comparative approach. I just popped up Carnarvon here, which is part of the British Historic Towns Atlas. And you can see this in operation, even though we do slightly, slightly different approaches to the 1500 map. Um, uh, the, as we saw, Keith told us last week how there's historical detail overlaid onto the town plan here. But having said that, um, you know, this is the starting point for comparative research. And you can see that Carrick Fergus in the north of Ireland here. And um, with Carnarvon, you can see they're both castle towns and start drawing conclusions about the, their walls, contemporary place names, individual plots, public and private buildings distinguished and, you know, offering potential for morphological analysis. Just to say something about the source material, we use the Ordnance Survey Manuscript town plans, as I said. Um, these, this, it, it, although it's, 
done at a standard scale in general these were done for the 19th century at a scale of one to 500 or one to two one is to 1056, five foot to the mile. They do vary. This is um, the small town of Carlingford, County Louth. So you can see that's quite sparse in the kind of uh, detail. But if we move to Cork, which we're working on at the present time, in comparison to uh, Carlingford, which are two sheets because it's a small place, Cork, which is, of course, one of our major cities, uh, would be covered in 33 sheets. Uh, it for its first first manuscript town plan in the 19th century and these are all held in the National Archives of Ireland under the collection Ordnance Survey 140 and you can see just the kind of wonderful detail <clears throat> that these maps hold and making it wonderful source material to base our 1500 map on uh, you can see here uh, individual house numbers which is quite unique uh, to Cork we're getting topographical or uh, top topographical detail there, uh, public institutions, street names, uh, internal detail such as steps and then nods to the past. These are these are sites that are not. So there's a touch of the historical map in these as well. A, a, a wonderful uh, source uh, and beautiful to look at and work with, I have to say. I just I can't go into process today because we don't, I don't have the time but this is just to give a flavour and um, I just uh, let me see <clears throat> this is uh, Mary D D Davies who was my predecessor and, and mentor indeed the former cartographic editor of the Irish Historic Times Atlas in our first office here in in the academy and um, back in 1992 with her drawing board in, in the background. And that's indeed where I started drawing my maps for the Atlas in the late 90s. Uh, and now here, bottom right, we are in, well, we were and we still are uh, on in 2021 to two with uh, the very bottom. This is in the middle of the lockdown. Uh, my colleague, Frank Cullen, who's digitizing the map for map two for Cork uh, in ArcGIS, of course, and with the weekly meetings on screen uh, with our colleague, Rachel Murphy. Um, and this is ongoing work. So we've gone from the drawing table to ArcGIS, and that's just a flavor of, of where things have, have moved. This is, again, as I said, work in progress on uh, on Cork, uh, which has been authored by uh, Howard Clark and Maureen E. Lee, work in progress. So any of you who know Cork, you can maybe pick out the shape of that city and, and see how far we've gotten with the uh, Ordnance Survey town plans, the background there, georectified and being digitized from there. And there's a little detail. Um, so the core maps, uh, uh, I, that's map two, but we also have map one, which shows the town and its surroundings, and then map threes and fours, which I won't dwell on because I'm just conscious of time, and map threes and four at the scale of one to five thousand. Map one is at the scale of one to fifty thousand, showing the town's surroundings, and maps three and four, based on the Ordnance Survey, um, and of course we work in, in with the Ordnance Survey in their production. Uh, so this would be the modern uh, town plan of Galway with contours overlaid to give you an idea of relief and then also the mid uh, 20th century town plan of the town as well and these are examples from Galway. Now moving on to the next component of, of the atlas which uh, cartographic component which are the historic maps, the early maps and town plans that we reproduce in the printed volumes in facsimile and you know, there's a fantastic collection of these. And now that we've published 30 towns in our series, I think I have done a, 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 a database of these. And I think there's something like 300 maps, historic maps that are reproduced on the pages of the Irish Historic Times Atlas. And there's a wonderful uh, range of material there uh, for, with a lot of potential in, it, in itself. So uh, this is just to show you Carrick Fergus, which was published in 1986 and obviously 1986 yeah and they were you know printing was very different then so everything was in black and white 
uh, and then just to move on to Carlingford, which was published in 2011. Again, a, a wider range. We, we had started at that point to include more regional maps. Uh, maps, we were, had the facility to reproduce them in colour, so developments there. Um, you know, so the, 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 the more scope uh, for including a variety of maps beyond sort of traditional town plans. Uh, so I mentioned that we've reproduced something like 300 uh, uh, historic maps as part of within the Historic Times Atlas, Irish Historic Times Atlas. But just to say that the originals of these are held in over 50 different locations, uh, with 58 in repositories in England and about 20 in private collections, to just give you a flavour. The Irish maps are spread between 11 different English repositories. Uh, the main ones would be the British Library and the National Archives in Kew. And then in Ireland, the main collections would be held in Trinity and in the National uh, National. Library of Ireland. Uh, some this is a, a, this is the Galway pictorial map which I mentioned earlier, which was reproduced in the Galway Atlas, but also dedicated or uh, given a, a, its own volume with a series of extracts by its author uh, Paul Walsh, who did a, a series of commentaries on it. And the original is held in the Hardyman collection, uh, which is a most treasured collection um, here in Ireland which is in Trinity. I'm just kind of going to slip into talking about thematic mapping here, but I, I just wanted to, to finish on in terms of the historic maps that we include in the Irish Atlas with examples from Limerick, because this is a great trio. Um, and Limerick is uh, a Munster town on the, on the West Coast. And uh, uh, North is orientated this way, but you can see uh, the, the shape of the town. And these are what I would call three very influential maps. So as well as being reproduced in the Limerick Atlas, you'll see the, this, the, these historic maps feeding into other aspects of, of, the, of the Atlas, of the Limerick Atlas. Um, and if I just show you uh, the, what we would call the historical compilation map or the po a pocket map. We also would produce this as a pocket map of Limerick. You can see the sort of shape and sites that would have been represented on these early maps of Limerick. Turn up again, reused, you know, and informing these other thematic style maps that are part of our project as well. So I just wanted to show you an example from one of our historical compilation maps, uh, or what we call our pocket maps, because we do produce them as pocket maps and include them in the atlas. And these are uh, broadly, they're, they're different in style, but I suppose you would have seen, Keith would have showed us some of the um, historical maps and, of Oxford and Coventry last week. So th these are this is our endeavour in the same guys. So you can see we do a big long index of sites and they're plotted onto a modern base uh, with the old river lines and walls outlined um, in different ways. Thematic mapping. Um, as go, is, is part of every atlas. We have uh, a whole range of thematic maps and, uh, you know, that vary from time, town to town, but I suppose there's always an effort made to recreate the early townscape. And this is an example, an author's uh, draft map for the town of Yall in County Cork, trying to figure out uh, the old, the, the line of the conjectural lines of walls um, and you can see, you know, phase one of the of the Burgage plots, conjectural extent, the 13th century, the 15th century. And this is a draft and this is how it turns up in the atlas. And, you know, you see experience question marks and broken lines and that kind of thing. And I just want to include a map of Cork as well, a process that we're going through at the moment. And on the left, you see Howard Clark's draft map of Cork in circa 1300 and how it's shaping up on the right hand side uh, to be uh, what would be a text map in the finished product uh, next year. Moving on to the text. Um, oh, I'm just going to have to speed up a bit here now. So we every atlas uh, has a, it's part of the definition of an atlas is to include a text, but I suppose in the Irish atlas, uh, we have a, quite a significant text section, uh, an essay, a topographic information, appendices, bibliography and notes. And I suppose we're 
we're quite proud of our, our topographical information section, which is basically a, a gazetteer of sites um, in the town. And a lot of the effort in the Irish Atlas scheme goes into the production of the, of the topographical information um, of site histories. And everything has a theme and a category, and it's essentially a GIS, really. And this is where um, all the documentary uh, references to sites in the town go into the topographical and you can see the kind of range of urban themes that we have devised these were devised from the outset of the project and we have stuck to that and it's provided pr proved to be a very very good model of putting order on the townscape um, and uh, you can just give you an idea of some of the sections for example manufacturing these are the kind of type sites that will turn up so this is what i would call the invisible map so when, even when we're not mapping in the atlas, we're thinking um, in categories and in a visual way. This is an example of a site from the topographical information. It's a site from Galway, uh, the, the county jail, which had, was in Blake's Castle. So as we know, some of these sites are very, very complex. Um, and it's a way of, of giving it a short history to the site and, and trying to explain in a verbal way, in a textual way, um, more details. So this adds hugely to the cartographic. This is from the pictorial map here of Blake's Castle. So this supplements this. So they go hand in hand. And that's why we talk an awful lot about maps and texts. The Hungarian atlas, actually, Kathleen May shows some examples from Hungary as well. The maps and the text meet very nicely when we start talking about the digital stream of what we do in the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. And I'm just going to show you quickly some examples from our, our GIS, uh, our online atlases. And you can see where the topographical information gets married, I suppose, within the layers, the map layers. So you might recognize that in the background as, as the map too. So we're now with the ArcGIS uh, online for for Galway and you can see uh, at the topographical information becomes attribute data and gets fed in that way. Here's our digital atlas of Dungarvan, uh, the market house uh, site and we have been able to layer some of the historic maps in Dungarvan so we're, 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 we're doing more all the time. Um, here's uh, with the digital atlas from Dungarvan again we did a whole series of videos to try and we want people to be able to use this so it's it's there's a uh so there's i think five five uh videos where uh we've a story map that we did with that so it's 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 developing all the time and that's as you can see the historic map layers overlaid there in the digital atlas of of dungarvan um, I could speak more about that in the in the in the later if you wish, um, but I might just look to to wrapping up now. I just put this up because it shows you a sort of timeline of our atlas evolution, I suppose, and um, you know it 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 shows where we've moved from establishment to the publication of fascicles in 1986, our bound volumes in 1996, our first city part. Dublin Part 1, which was published in 2002. We began publishing pocket maps in 2002 as well. We got into the business of ancillary publications in about 2004. We were getting into CD-ROMs in 2008. We began our seminar series in 2009 because we had enough atlases to compare. We got into book, books of map extracts in 2010. The user's guide in 2011. The maps and text series began in 2013. And then, you know, really momentous, the release of our first digital atlas, which was Derry, with um, Derry City Council and Queen's in 2013. We launched our IHC online in 2016. We started producing Dublin suburbs in 2017. And then the publication of the first print and digital atlas together was last year, or well, 2020 with Dungarvan. And then we're very much in, in the midst of pre preparing Cork, which will be done all as, it'll be the largest atlas to date, uh, Howard, Clark and Maureen Lee are preparing that. So these are, this is where we've been and where we're going. And just to show you some forthcoming publications, there's um, a mock-up of the cover of Cork, which is, as I said, coming soon. And also Drumcondra in the IHT Dublin Suburb series um, is coming along as well. And um, also just to mention our annual seminar, um, I suppose is focusing on where, where 
where we're going as well, which is this strong interest in 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 using in using the atlas and encouraging people to use it, whether it's as reusing geodata, the work we've been doing with Daniel uh, and the folks in, in Minster uh, using our the kind of data that the atlas has produced are here in Ireland. Uh, we would love to see the atlas used and utilised more in archaeology and in planning and uh, planning. Um, so this is our seminar, which is happening next Thursday. And please do, you can, you can book uh, via our website, ihda.ie. You can find all the information there. So this will just give you a flavour of, of where we're at at the moment. And we're interested in finding out how people are using our atlas and how, we might, uh, how they might use it and sharing the information in that way. But I think I'm definitely out of time. So I will leave it at that for now. And um, thank you very much for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. That was absolutely terrific. I think you can probably now have a bit of a rest for a little while and gather your thoughts. And uh, it's time for uh, a Q&A. So that was a really great exemplar of taking us right through the history of what you've been doing in Ireland and there's you've just been so busy and there's such a huge amount of material there I'm delighted that you finished off by focusing on next week's event because I was going to ask you about that um, so anyone out there in the audience who's uh, been in on this uh, talk um, if you're keen on joining that event all the details are in the chat. I think Jen has just popped them in there. So please do go along. I would encourage that very strongly. Um, I think you can be nothing but enthused by the build-up that Sarah has given us today, which has been absolutely terrific. Now, for me, just enjoying that talk, listening to the talk, watching the talk, I was really thrilled to see the atlas in action. So I think you showed one shot where we had people working in libraries, we had conferences, we had launches, uh, we had students coming into the academy. And that looked terrific, uh, really getting people involved and active. But I wonder if you could tell us a little more about what sort of response you've had to the digital atlases and how people are responding to those. Yeah, um, I suppose that the, the main step for us in terms of, of the digital side of things really has been the accessibility to the Atlas material. I think we've really noticed uh, like going online with what we would call the back catalogue has, has reached so much a much bigger audience. So there's obviously the, the printed Atlas like the sales have not gone down of the printed atlas, but I think the online accessibility via, now this is via the PDFs mainly online has, has really opened up. So it's particularly kind of for classroom use or for people who uh, might be working as, as an historical consultant in a town and need access to information about sites quite quickly. You know, I think the online aspect where, where people genuinely may not just have the time or access to a printed atlas, I think accessibility has been massive um, in, in terms of providing any kind of atlas material in any format online. So I suppose that's the first point I'd make about that. Um, in terms of the interactive atlases, the, the GIS atlases, I think, you know, actually we're you know, we're going to do a, a survey on this. Um, uh, our colleagues here in the academy are, are, are preparing a survey at, at the moment to, to see how people uh, use the Atlas. And, um, and, and we actually did several interviews some years ago about, about that kind of thing. But it, it's hard to know really to date how, how, how people are interacting with the, with the with the digital, like with the GIS based at, because there's obviously such an enormous amount of potential with it. Um, and we've done Galway and we've done Derry. And I know that, uh, for example, the 
the dairy stuff definitely was used in terms of preparing exhibitions that they went on to do exhibitions of and um we've worked we've it, but it's more verbal reports of how people have found the Galway material very very interesting and then we've only just launched Dungarvan quite recently and that's the one I suppose we, we put a lot of effort into in terms of providing tutorials and uh, a story map to go with it and a user's guide. So we really put a lot of effort into to providing the materials to help people to use it because um, it is sort of experimental. Um, so so I, I think we've more work to do there in terms of, of, of just finding out exactly how people are using it. Uh, we use it ourselves all the time and fellow Atlas makers uh, use it. Um, but in terms of, of uh, the wider groups that we'd, we'd like to find out more about how, how they're using them, I think, yeah. Does that, ha does that help, Nick? It most definitely does. Um, it's, it must be really... Um reassuring and rewarding to realize you've got all this going on in the background with people interacting with the atlases and such positivity and i can only congratulate you on the huge amount of work that's gone on to produce this so um it's amazing absolutely amazing and it's something for the rest of us i think to look at and think you know there there is the path has been trod um let's see how we can emulate that but I, yeah, I, Go on. Yeah. No, Go on. I just I think that's part of having the framework and mm. the the you know the, the framework of the wider scheme and then obviously the cooperation of so many people for so many years mm. who kind of stick with the project. Um so like that that's been a, a huge factor. So you're obviously learning all the time. So we're 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 still learning like in terms of at the Atlas methodologies and now we're into this, you know, the whole you know, whole, whole other um world of digital data where it's all becoming data so that that's quite exciting so you like to see people using it and where, where we don't necessarily have the expertise you know um but you know i mean that's one way people have used the the digital atlases is in the is in the classroom so it's an exemplar so you see a lot a lot of people like it's been used in in dundalk for example in the dit there um uh, was used as a as an exemplar for uh, digital humanities students to build digital atlases so it's, it's used as raw material in that way as well so I, i'm not sure that was ever something that we anticipated you know a real bonus yeah, yeah. well sarah there's loads of questions flooding in on the q a so let's begin um do you encourage philanthropic foundation and corporate sponsorship support for the production of atlases in addition to local individual and organizational support Yes, we uh, our core funding is from the Royal Irish Academy, which is funded by the Higher Education Authority. So that is what funds the staffing and the accommodation. And then um, for every town that we produce, uh, we would look for sponsorship. But our first port of call, I think, would be from the relevant local authority. And we've had some really great working relationships with mm -hmm. the local councils. Uh, involved in the towns uh, that we produce and for example Dublin you know long-standing arrangements as well so for Dublin City Council <clears throat> would um, be a key stakeholder in the uh, Dublin suburb series so that would be we'd have a funding arrangement with them over a whole series of years so that we you know without that backing uh, I don't think we could do so it, it's mainly from local authorities and you know, from time to time, Guinness uh, supported the publication of Dublin, and there's been other private benefactors as well. But our our main is is in the main it would be um, working with uh, lo local authorities uh, to supplement uh, things like the printing of the maps. Uh, we would have gotten funding from you know the Heritage Council has supported us, and then I have to say like. You know, we get a lot of pro bono support. I mean, the Ordnance Survey is hugely supportive, uh, and they they do the work for us without requiring massive amounts of money. So that's a partnership. And then, obviously, every piece of research that is done for the Atlas, apart from well, it's some there's some paid research if we can afford it, and that would be where we would get sponsorship. 
Um, for example, we've just got some sponsorship via Mayo County Council to do some research on Westport and Atlas of Westport, which is in County Mayo on the West Coast. So that, that, that's a separate fund for, for that. That will help the author in that case. But the authors do not get paid. The editors do not get paid. And so there's, you know, again, that's sort of, you can't really account for that um, because it, well, we wouldn't be able to do it if they did get paid. <laughs> <laughs> of what they deserve so yeah, I suppose yeah. you're in a position now where you've created this critical mass of atlases so I'm guessing everybody must want one now you're out there you're very visible across Ireland and um, it seems only right that more towns should come to the party and just to work on that and expand on it one of the questions from the floor is do you have an idea of how many more towns you plan to cover for example in the next five to ten years and how do you go about planning which towns to cover yeah well we had a as i said in the presentation we had this initial list of 40 and we have wavered off that list do you know there's some towns that were on um, that weren't on that list that got on the list and you know there'd be sort of a meeting of of, of various factors that would allow those towns and uh, like funding does come into it a suitable author because it, they're very very hard to do you know or, or, I don't mean that but well they are difficult but you know you, it's very hard to have a, a very full job and and do an atlas as well and it's particularly now for academics who have such busy schedules it's you know i think it's very very hard to find the time required to collect all that topographical information in particular so they do take many many years uh we've lots of times in the pipeline um uh so Cork, as I mentioned, and there's a, a five or six towns that are, are well advanced coming at, coming up after that. I mentioned Tralee, uh, Tullamore, Cavan, uh, Carlo, which was on the map, but isn't, you know, there's there's several author, lots of authors working on towns uh, as I speak, and we have workshops with authors from time to time to kind of share information. So we have, I, I think we've, yeah, about like five very active towns and then maybe another five that are sort of you know in, in more early to medium stages so we do have 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 lots of time towns waiting in the wings and you know we've we've interest in more suburbs I mean there would be more interest than we are able to are able to do and that comes down to having uh this core team that we have that that are able to to to, to edit and go through and, and and meet the meet the requirements of the project really so there, there's yeah so we we do have that we don't quite know what's going to come next after cork because cork is, is is a massive one for us um, and after cork we'll have waterford in in the future as well which is another big uh city for us for us to do and then there'd be there'd be more smaller medium towns in between that as well um so it really depends on where drafts are at in terms of how we decide and um potentially then maybe if there's funding assistance to 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 carry it through to publication as well okay thanks and just thinking about this build-up of towns is there a sense of national pride in the atlas series do you think um is it it's a tremendous undertaking for a relatively small country that's known for its rural heritage. I think there, there, I think there, yes, there is, there is a national pride about there's certainly like when we publish a town, um, there's certainly local pride, uh, when, uh, when, a, when, a, when a town is published and part of that is being part of the bigger scheme, you know, I mean, to be able to say that you're part, you know, of this massive endeavor that stretches right across Europe, it makes a place feel pretty special. And then in terms of national recognition, I mean, our president launched Galway uh, in 2016, I think, sorry, I'm all COVID. <laughs> COVID has interrupted the timeline. And, you know, then we went, you know, he, he invited us to the, the Oris, the author of Drada, and congratulated everybody involved. And that felt like national recognition. And, you know, um, I think I think it is appreciated the uh, as a as an academy research project. Um, it's it's recognised the amount of effort uh, that's going into this, and I and I hope then that it feeds into other aspects of Irish life. Um, 
so so i yeah okay Thank i you hope so that. that sounds seriously <laughs> impressive to me um thinking of the sort of more of the national issue um have you any thoughts on the potential and scope for using the irish atlases to explore shared heritage um in a north south context on the island um as well as east west across the irish sea for example opening up cross community dialogue in particular areas of the north perhaps uh, yes well um we are actually and i should have mentioned this in the presentation but we are actually hosting ireland is hosting the next meeting of the international commission for the history of towns which you know, you saw the photograph of us in Budapest in 2019. And then last year, it was actually in Split in Croatia, but it was quite stripped down because of, of people were just, it was so hard to meet. So um, for 2022, um, we're hosting it, hosting it in, in Ireland, which for reasons I outlined earlier, it's, it's, it's by its very existence is cross-border because we, um, produce the Northern Towns as part of the Irish Stark Towns Atlas, but at the same time, the chair of the British Stark Towns Atlas is Keith Lilly. Um, he's based in Queen, so there's a beautiful complexity to all of that. And I think the International Commission for the History of Towns will, has, is, is already providing uh, a platform to explore more that idea of shared heritage. And in fact, as part of that, we'd be doing a, a field trip, cross-border field trip and that will leave, this is in September. Uh, so we'll have lots of delegates from the European scheme, from the British Historic Times Atlas coming to Manus and Dublin and talking about uh, urban crisis as a theme. And then on one of the days, there's actually this, this cross-border field trip going through Kells and Cavan and Enniskillen up to Derry, where we're going to have our Atlas Working Group meeting. So, you know, I, I think there probably will be uh, a lot of impetus from that to explore more this idea of, of shared heritage. It's obviously, it got enormous potential. Um, and, the map, you know, looking at that at, at, at the idea of heritage through maps um, and considering it. I, th I think that's something that will will be opened up probably from discussions that we'll have as part of the International Commission meeting in September, which we're really excited about um, for all sorts of reasons. But um, it's wonderful that we're having it in Ireland. I mean, this kind of it's first time, like two projects will be hosting it in one place. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's, it's very exciting. And the fact that we're kind of ambitiously going to Derry as well, you know, I think Belfast is often um, the path that people would take, but we're, we're taking this kind of cross uh, north western route up to, to Derry, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that sounds absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I'm sure many of the people on this call will very much hope to be there. I, I know there are, certain, there are certainly some definites on the call who will be there. So that's absolutely great. I'm sure it'll be an absolutely terrific experience. So, um, yeah, we look forward to hearing all about it. A completely different question now. What governs the choice of colour for the cover? Um, some we saw were bright orange, others a little more sober. What's the story there? Yeah, um, so this, there's a kind of a greeny colour that we use for the main series. Is, is, is that, 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 that's been the kind of traditional um, cover colour um it's a sort of pale green and i can only presume that that color was chosen because it's the the color of ireland <laughs> to to begin with and then at a certain point we threw a bit of red in there just to liven it up we're we're, we're we still use that kind of duo tone for the main series then for the suburbs the dublin suburb series that might have been uh where the we we, we went uh, to a lot of trouble to try and go for a new format for the Dublin suburbs. So there was a lot of work went into, because we wanted to retain the core maps in that, but we were very keen to try out having a bound atlas rather than loose sheets. And um, so a lot of work went into a sort of a re redesign for the suburbs. And because there isn't quite so much topographical information in the suburb series, we were able to sort of do that in a reasonable way. So there is a completely different design for the Dublin suburbs series. So that is, is, is the difference. So we have retained the original color scheme 
because of the because the series started in 1986 and we sort of retained that the whole way through uh, we, we, we we still produce more or less the exact same format uh, for the for the main atlas series and now since 2017 we have this different format with the same ingredients but a different format for the dublin suburbs series which is a so series in itself so they'll all look the same but they will they are different looking to the green Brilliant. Thank you. That makes perfect sense, I think. But uh, yeah, all, all bits of artistic design thrown in as well. Um, going back to something a little more cartographic. So where does the data which is included within the topographical information entries come from? Is it from the original OS maps or is it from third party sources? The data is lovingly collected by the authors. It's like, it's trawl, it's historical research. It's, it comes from so many sources. So there'd be a mix of, yes, cartographic sources. So there would be a, a sort of bedrock, I would call it, of extracting street names, building names uh, from, say, Ordnance Survey, street uh, Ordnance Survey, historic maps. You know, so you get a, a street name and that, that gets fed into streets section. Uh, the church name church gets fed into the religion section. But aside from that, there's a huge amount of documentary sources, uh, manuscript sources, uh, printed government sources, uh, other map pre-ordnance survey map sources, um, annals, uh, deeds, uh, newspapers, directories. So that the reason it takes so long is because authors are busily uh, trawling sources and, and disentangling or, or collecting references and then feeding that into the category of the topographical information. And then after that, there's this huge editorial effort to sort of make sure it's all sitting in the right place with the right kind of, you know, um, cross references and all of that so so there's a a long long process of collecting the data it's we you know it's, it's not pulled from anywhere it's it's got <laughs> it's you know somebody is out there in a library several people are probably out there now uh you know putting pieces of topographical information together that will then inform the whole atlas Oh, that's great to hear. Um, uh, it's lovely to hear this side of the story about all the, the research being pulled in to create the Atlas. But turning that on its head, what evidence do you have of the Atlases being used to further research as a result of the, the content of the Atlas? So practical, positive research out there. I, I, I think it's... it's um... There's obviously, you know, there's been quite a lot of comparative research has been carried out as 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 part of the the maps and text series. So for the annual seminars, that that's really a sort of an anchor point for for people looking at taking the atlases. It's a prerequisite for for for, for being part of the conference. Actually, is to take the atlases both within Ireland and then um, a further afield as well, and trying to uh, to to come up with some uh comparative themes um and and publish publish the results from that so that that that's uh one element through the through the maps and text series and then um there's been some work done uh as part of the international scheme the uh, a, a volume called lords and towns was uh published by with editors angrid sims and, and howard clark a few years ago uh with papers that would have been Again, comparative urban use research, but a lot of material coming from the atlas. Atlases went into that as well. Uh, so, uh, some of the work Daniel Strack is doing um, on methodologies in terms of how we create the maps in the, in the digital in GIS, and also how we create our our, our material for to, for geodata. That that's kind of live research at the moment, working with. Uh, colleagues in Warsaw who are part of this house project so the ontology of the urban landscape stuff going on there then at a local level um we don't always know actually but we lo you, we got lots of requests all the time to to use our material as part of architectural our architectural and archaeological reports so it's uh 
springboard uh, so for for any kind of heritage type work going on in a town uh, the atlas would be the first port of call if there is such a thing for that town so for example even the bibliography in an atlas would be a, a one-stop shop for for where you you know a, a, a comprehensive bibliography for anything on the built heritage at the date of publication obviously you know work is always going on on the on these towns so uh, it would feed the, the work of the atlas would feed into a lot of uh, unpublished reports i think um in terms of planning and archaeology uh projects or you know waterways projects there's uh, work gone on in, in galway that would have used the, the atlas for that as well right well it's really good to hear that, that it's got such a positive impact. Um, just moving back a bit now, I'm backtracking. The Royal Irish Academy. Um, so why, how, when did it decide to act as host for the Atlas? So it was, the Academy was approached. So I, I think because of, you know, that sort of 1980s, the wood key, the activity around all of that, there was this a great appetite and group of scholars who 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 were part of that movement uh, historians geographers archaeologists and uh, there was a real appetite there to i mean urban heritage really became a thing in ireland um, at that point uh, spurred on by by woodkey and then at the same time People like Angrid Sims were 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 involved in the international side of things. Mm -hmm. There was the framework that was already there at the international. So they built, I suppose they pitched it to the Royal Irish Academy, which would have been the ideal place because it's interdisciplinary or interinstitutional. So it was no one uh university that was going to be hosting it because because it, it, it obviously needed this kind of interdisciplinary inter, interinstitutional um so i think they would have the academy would have been the natural the natural home for it but i mean that just because it is the natural home doesn't mean it's going to be the natural home but i think that's where it comes down to timing and pub there was so much public interest and and then the academy is obviously international as well. So the fact that the Historic Times Atlas had the international string to its bow as well, um, it was a framework that was already working. Um, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer, but at the same time, it 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 wasn't. It, it, it I think it was timing and people uh, convincing people. Uh, with convincing arguments and saying we're willing to do the work, we're willing to do it. We're look at look at us all with this great willingness, and that has continued until the, and continues still, you know. So it wouldn't be anything if you didn't have the the people behind it who were willing to to put the energy and, and the work into it. So I think it's a combination of all those factors, and the academy obviously recognised that. Thank God. So um, or whatever, yeah. Sounds like a, a very successful and convenient arrangement. And I think on this side of the water, we can only look look across to Dublin with um, envy about how marvellous that, that must be to have a permanent base. But that aside, here's a question. How about a Van Morrison lyrics themed atlas? Yeah, well, you know, start your songwriting. Uh, when Roddy Doyle actually launched Dublin Part Three, which mm -hmm. was our the uh, the Dublin Atlas that dealt with the period 1756 to 1846, and and uh, if you know Ro Roddy Doyle, the well known Dublin writer, he loves maps. He was a geography teacher himself, so he came along and launched Dublin Part Three for us. And he said he loved it. He loved the title and that he thought that definitely Brad Pitt should star in the movie because it was called Part 3. So we've had that suggestion. So I don't see why Van shouldn't set about <laughs> maybe writing a song for it as well. Sounds like a decent way forward. Well, I think we've worked you probably hard enough this, uh, this evening, Sarah. So thanks for taking the time out to answer everything so comprehensively everything that the audience has thrown at you i'm sure everyone really appreciates uh 
seeing some wonderful maps, hearing some wonderful stories and appreciating the impact that the Irish series has on Ireland and people using the maps. It's also, we're now on week three of this series and it's been great to compare your story with the British one and the German one. And for people still here on the call, do remember that in a fortnight's time, we have the final session with Kathleen Schende on Central and Eastern European um, Historic Towns Atlas, Historic Towns Atlases. So do try to come along to that if you can. Um, I think all that remains now is for me to thank Sarah for a terrific um, presentation this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank our backroom team as well for making it all happen and work so seamlessly. So thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Um, thanks to Liz for opening things up. And I just hope that you all have um, a very pleasant evening. It's a lovely evening here in Oxford tonight. I, I hope it's the same in Dublin. And uh, Sarah, thanks again. And we hope to see everybody else in a fortnight's time for the final session. So um, enjoy the rest of the evening, everybody, and good evening from Oxford. Goodbye.